this morning, uh, I have a question. Who doesn't enjoy getting an award or a good grade or even the process of earning that reward? But you know, today, some people want to skip that process, you know, bypass the test. Some would prefer to get the reward without the effort of running a race, uh, getting a prize without expending the energy, maybe losing weight without the sacrifice. Okay, maybe that was hitting below the belt. But for Christians, a test is coming down the road, and it's unavoidable, and it's serious. In 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10, Rich read for us this morning, Paul says we will appear at the judgment seat of Christ to be examined. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due to us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now, for clarity, I want to be sure and identify the judgment that Paul is talking about in this verse. The New Testament speaks of two judgments that will take place before the Lord. One is the great white throne judgment, which, of course, is for non-believers. The second one is the one that Paul specifically identifies here as the judgment seat of Christ, which is for believers. The New Living Translation says, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. When I see the words, all stand, I think of a courtroom. You know where you hear them say, all stand or all rise as the judge enters the room. Now, I'm not sure how you would feel standing in the room when the judge entered you know, the proceedings, but I can guarantee you that my emotional frame while standing in the room would have everything to do with where I am physically in the room. If I was in the back, maybe having just stepped in out of the hallway out of curiosity, I think I'd be pretty calm. But if the judge suddenly called out my name and told me to step forward and have a seat at one of the tables in front of him, I can guarantee you that my emotions would be very different. Well, at the judgment seat of Christ, I won't be standing in the back. I'll be front and center as my works will be thrown on the fire. Now, just as a side note, notice that Paul specifies that this judgment is based on our actions while we have this earthly body. In much of this chapter, chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, Paul describes the difference between these two different body types. In verse 1, he says, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God as an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands, but meanwhile we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Did you notice the references to the different body types? Earthly tent, building from God, eternal house, heavenly dwelling. This tent, again, heavenly dwelling and mortal. It makes me think what a blessing it will be to someday trade in this body of flesh for a heavenly dwelling, an eternal house, a building from God. Now, some people have asked if this judgment, the judgment seat of Christ that Paul is talking about here, is that something to fear? Didn't Jesus promise us that we'd never face condemnation? And addressing this question, Pastor John MacArthur had this to say. It's nothing to fear in one sense, but in another sense, it's something to be concerned about. 
Why is it nothing to fear? Because it's not a judgment for punishment. In other words, it simply says that your works will be tested. They will be determined whether they're gold, silver, precious stones, that is, valuable spiritual works with eternal impact, or whether your efforts were wood, hay, and stubble. Wood, hay, and stubble is not sinful. Wood, hay, and stubble is just valueless, useless, replaceable, or consumable. And many of our activities in this life fall into that category. We do so many things as believers that just don't have any internal value. When we appear at the judgment seat of Christ, all the wood, hay, and stubble disappear, and what is left is the gold, silver, and precious stones. It's because of these leftovers that we will receive praise from God. But we should be afraid in the sense that when we get there, we want to have as much gold, silver, and precious stones as possible so that at the judgment seat of Christ, we can see the worthless things fade away and have a full reward, which we can then cast at our Savior's feet. Thinking about this judgment makes me think back on employee or performance Some of you, like me, may have had them as an employee at a company or business. For those of you who are not familiar with this practice, it's a time when your boss looks back on your work over the past year to judge how you've done, what you've done, and possibly set some goals for the coming year. Usually the ranking is something like one through seven, with seven being the best. Or your past work is rated as exceptional or exceeds expectations or meets expectations, or maybe improvement needed or unsatisfactory. You can guess which ones you hope you would never have to deal with in a meeting like that. And needless to say, meetings like that could make you a little nervous. Now, some of you have entered contests that are judged with the goal of a first-place ribbon or trophy. But I don't think too many of us have been a part of a contest or a review where the, at the conclusion, you give all of the rewards, all of the achievements, all of the recognition, all of the accolades back to the person who's making the judgment. Let's look at that verse again. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. The thing that was driving Paul's ambition was the knowledge that there would be a penetrating uncovering of the depths of his heart by the Lord himself. This judgment, or review if you want to call it, will take place in the future when all believers must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Look at these specific words. The words must and all stress that this event will take place and no one will get a pass for this event. The, that knowledge produced in Paul a strong motivation to please God in this life. Look at the word appear. Now, in the Greek, and I won't try and impress you with my ability to speak Greek, but the word is phaniru, which means to manifest, to make clear, to make visible, visible, or to reveal. Now, commenting on the meaning of the word, Philip Hughes writes, to be made manifest means not just to appear, but to be laid bare, stripped of every outward facade of respectability, and openly revealed in the full and true reality of one's character. That should weigh heavy, heavily on your, on your heart. Some have argued that at this judgment, believers' secret motives and heart attitudes will be manifest to everyone in attendance. But in my search, I haven't found any biblical support for that. 
I would guess, honestly, that believers will probably be too preoccupied with the unveiling of their own deeds to be paying much attention to the revealing of others. Nor do I believe believers' hearts need to be manifest to the omniscient God who already knows every detail of our lives. In that day, the full truth about our lives, our character, our deeds will be made clear. But notice that they will be made clear to us. Each of us will discover the real verdict of our ministry, our service, and our motives. All hypocrisy and pretense will be stripped away. All temporal matters with no eternal significance will vanish like wood, hay, and stubble. And only what is left is what is to be rewarded as eternal value 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Jesus tells us in Matthew Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. The writer of Hebrew adds, Nothing in all creation is hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The true assessment of the work that God has done in and through believers will be disclosed on that day. Remember that this judgment is revealing the quality of your work before the Lord Jesus. Believers will not be judged for the sin at the judgment seat of Christ because every sin of every believer was judged at the cross. 2 Corinthians says, When God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Also in Galatians, At the cross, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. 1 Peter says, As our substitute, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and to live to righteousness. Also in Hebrews, he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. And because of his atoning sacrifice on our behalf, Romans 8, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also, praise God, intercedes for us. But though salvation is not by works, works are an inevitable result of true salvation. Philip Hughes continues, he says, it's worth remembering that the justification of the sinner is by faith in Christ and not by works of his own. But the hidden root of faith must bring forth the visible fruit of good works. The, this fruit is expected by Christ, for it brings glory to the Father and is evidence to the world of the dynamic reality of divine grace. And it is especially in the bearing of much fruit that the Father is glorified. As it says in John 15, 8, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Going back to the image of the judge in the courtroom, I want to look at the judgment seat. The judgment seat translates bema, which in its simplest definition describes a place reached by steps or a platform. In Greek culture, Bema referred to the elevated platform on which victorious athletes receive their crowns. Think of it much like the medal stand that you might see in the Olympics. In the New Testament, it was used in describing the judgment seats for men like Pilate, 
Herod, and Festus. A person who was brought before a Bema to have their deeds examined might be in a judicial sense of an indictment or exoneration, or for the purpose of recognizing and rewarding some achievement. Paul is very specific in this verse who is sitting on that judgment seat. God the Father is the ultimate judge, but he has given all judgment to the Son, as it tells us in John 5. Now, next look at the phrase, each one. This stresses the personal nature of the believer's judgment. It's an individual, not a collective. It makes me think of the time that I heard of a woman who said that uh, she was looking forward to this time of the judgment seat of Christ because as a married woman, her husband was the head of the household. And she saw herself more sitting by the crystal sea, enjoying a nice glass of something cool to drink, while her husband was inside having to answer for everything that had gone on. <laughs> I don't think that's what Scripture is telling us. Okay, uh, going back to the point, it, its purpose is not judicial. It is that every believer may be recompensed for his deeds in the body. Now, recompensed is one of those, what do they call it, $5, $10 words. It means to receive back what is due, whether punishment for a criminal or reward for the one to be honored. When believers stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be recompensed for the deeds they have done in the body. Romans 12.1 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Looking again at our main verse, these last two words have caused confusion and debate amongst believers. Good or bad. The use of bad, as Paul uses it here, does not indicate that judgment is a judgment on sin, since all their sins have already been judged in Christ. The word bad here does not translate for moral evil, but it means worthless or useless, kind of like a bad piece of fruit. Like it's good for nothing, it's impossible that any true gain will come from it. It describes those mundane things that inherently are neither of a new or sinful, such as taking a walk, going shopping, taking a drive in the country, maybe pursuing an advanced degree, moving up the corporate ladder, painting pictures, or writing poetry. Those morally neutral things will be judged when believers stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's done with the motive to glorify God then they will be considered good. If they were pursued for selfish interests, they'll be considered bad. The clearest definition between good and bad or worthless things is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it when it is revealed by fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. The apostle Peter exhorted, Excuse me. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self control, to self control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of. Of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, 
Be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Believers build for eternity, not with wood, hay, or straw, but with gold, silver, and precious stones. The latter are valuable, permanent, and indestructible, and will survive the fire of judgment. The former, though not evil, are worthless and combustible. They illustrate things with no lasting eternal value. The fire symbolizes judgment, will consume them in that day when each man's work becomes evident. Let's look at what Paul said to the Philippians in thinking about himself. He said, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I do press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed for me. As we see all of these beautiful fall, the fall season, it's a time that many of us will be raking the falling leaves and making burn piles. When you do, take a moment and look at those piles as you will on the day of judgment. To those of us who have been faithful in little or much, our reward will be little or much. Based upon that uh, what we did in our body here on earth. And if we're building a foundation for our own glory or our own recognition, then those things will burn up. If you are doing things for yourself, even though you say it's for God, you fail to glorify God in word, in deed, and song. If what you're doing for Him, you're doing to be seen, then you'll have your, your reward here and now. That's all. And if we ascribe our good works to ourselves, we rob God of glory. If we fail to give God credit for the good things, then we rob God of glory. If we say one thing but live another way, we are not glorifying God. Whatever does not glorify Him and is not done for Him and His glory is all for nothing. Those works done to be seen will all be burned up on that day, just like the branch and leaf pile in my backyard. Sooner or later, it's all going to go up in smoke. Let's pray. Father, I first off want to glorify you. I thank you for this hope that we have. And standing before you, Father, that the things that we do here on this earth, first off, will be burned away, leaving those things that only have value, the gold, the silver, the precious stones. And Lord, I'm, I am truly not qualified right now here on this earth to measure which things are and which things aren't. I know my heart. I still fight pride. I still fight uh, deceit, selfishness, all of these things, Father. And Lord, because of that, I have a feeling that I'm sadly going to be surprised at what is left once the fire has burned away everything else. But Lord, I pray, in spite of me, that things will still come to your glory, that things will still be brought forward that I can lay before your feet. Because, Father, it's only because of you. It's nothing of me. And Lord, help each of us as we leave here today and we head out into the week to remember all that we do, we should strive to do for your glory, not ours. And Lord, we do thank you for this hope and this promise. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.